data science itself is a definition that is getting standardized by the day uh, over the years. So what we are going to present uh, is something on the machine learning, and that too on the probabilistic machine learning, something not deep, not deep learning. So we are going to talk about, uh, can deep learning work with this? Yes, it can. Uh, but is it going to be in the same paradigm as that of a neural network? Probably not. So let us see what probabilistic graphical models are. Uh, but before that, a uh, short introduction uh, why we are doing this. Uh, at Mysuru Consulting Group, uh, we are a group of uh, folks who enjoy machine learning. We have been doing this uh, for our uh, fun and also helping uh, clients essentially with these areas. So uh, we have our team here. Uh, some of the work that has been done so far to give you an idea, uh, I will just speak a few landmarks as to why we are talking about this related to the workshop. So we have, you might have heard of LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation, right, in text uh, or natural language processing. So Ria is uh, has a contributor to that, to David Blaze Lab's uh, original LDA. She has added methods to it and we have been using that to uh, automate some of the existing uh, recognition tasks within the natural language processing. Myself, I have been doing this uh, for fun um, and I uh, have been doing this for my career as well uh, for a long time. Uh, it's it's getting better and better with newer algorithms being added to it, and uh, we see lots of use cases. So now let's get into probabilistic graphical models. Let's try to see why. Let's try to take a scenario and then go from the scenario to explain uh, as to uh, the importance of uh, graphical models. And then later, Ria will take over and have hands-on exercises. We are giving away everything for uh, free. It'll be online. It's open source. You can access the notebooks. Feel free to copy it, share it, uh, keep the logo in place. So that uh, you know, we, the diagrams are also generated in using LaTeX, and uh, we have Praveen who's done that as well, uh, using visualization tools that we have in house. So let's take a scenario here. The head of a top restaurant, he wants he or she wants to solve a problem, which is that let's say a new dish has been introduced. Maybe it is the new dosa in Vidyarthi Bhavan, if you're in from Bangalore, right? Or it could be a new dish that has been introduced in a nice restaurant, and now let's say and people love it, right? So this has changed the number of people who go into the restaurant. What makes, uh, what, how, how would you th think about this problem? Now the idea is you want to find out why the traffic is because of the new dish. Are people coming in because of the new dish that was introduced to the restaurant, in the restaurant, or is it, or is it because perhaps you know, uh, there, was, there were no other restaurants in the vicinity, or perhaps uh, the traffic that day was so clear that people felt they could go to this restaurant. Basically, many, many factors influence a decision. And let's, let's see what kind of uh, a problem that we are trying to solve here. So the idea here is, as I said, we want to find out and make decisions and to find out specifically how good the dish is that is actually causing the traffic is getting into the restaurant, the reason why people are you know, happy about it. So how would you try to solve it? Now, the, uh, the head of the restaurant would call in a machine learning engineer or a data scientist and tell him or her, you know, I have this problem, can you measure? I want to find out why. And not just get predictions, of course everybody wants predictions, but along with that we want to know why. So what are the data that's, that a data scientist would demand, right? Or an AI person would demand. It's the amount of traffic, historical data sets, Anything that you think would be useful in modeling, probably along with that also things that you don't know but you have the data for and you would allow your model to find out, right? And so this can include type of traffic, city events such as games that could be happening and uh, can you model now with all these data sets, can you model how busy it would be? So the answer to it, apply a deep learning neural net with all features and target vector, train it increase number of layers as you can, get the highest prediction, make sure you don't overfit and you're done. Great, you've been able to successfully predict it. And now what happens? So let's look at this. Now we have a deep neural net, right? So here is the deep neural net and uh, we have all the inputs that we think will be useful in uh, getting the predictions. Now, what happens with uh, the deep neural nets? Can you tell as to 
if the data is less for training? What happens if we have less data for training? What if we don't have enough information? Can you train your deep net? And if it is busy today, how likely is it because of the game or due to the new dish? It may not be due to the new dish. It's because perhaps a game that was happening there, people wanted to go to the restaurant and uh, you know they're hungry in the game. And this is, the, this is probably the decent restaurant nearby. And how would you hike the pay of the new chef? You know, he, he or she is going to demand more. You know, it's because of my dish, everybody's coming here. I, I want more pay. And what about the weather? Suppose it's raining. You know, now it's the monsoon season. Not everybody wants to go out. And what if it's a pedestrian? People like to walk. So these are real business problems, right? You need large number of data sets. It's never enough. They're not interpretable always. You can. There are studies to say that interpretation can be done with neurons. You can think of a hyperplane and uh, sigmoid functions, activation functions. There's work being uh, done there. But how far? I don't think we are so far there yet. And it doesn't account for future unseen parameters. Suppose new parameters comes along the way, or new data, data set comes along the way. Can you, do you have to retrain your net? And many firms, um, they don't pay for models that they don't understand. If you go to businesses and say, hey, I'm getting 95% or 90% accuracy, but I, don't, I cannot tell you why. Can you pay? I don't think businesses want to invest in that. Of course, I mean, this is not entirely what I'm saying is not entirely true. They are investing in areas where you see accuracies, but you need to get reasons would make it a stronger case. And so in 1986, Jeff Hinton himself who contributed to some of these methods, he says that these should be dispensed away with. I think it's in the MIT review. I don't know how many of you read this, but he says that these methods are all that we are working with are three decades old, right? They should be dispensed away with, and we need to find newer ways to solve these problems or a new path to AI. Now let's say that instead of having the, uh, the, the kind of neurons that we have, which are, um, say, a new dish accident. Can you make space a little bit, shuffle a bit? No, we have people standing there. Please be seated. Give them some space. Yeah. Let's say if we move a little bit from here to this scenario, from from this scenario to to something like this. We know accident in game affects the traffic, right? We know we know this happens. Instead of having them all in a single layer, as we saw earlier, what if we had something? that is having a dependency where you have accident in game affecting traffic and there's a new dish that we don't know if it's affecting or not. It's independent. Or suppose we know that sunny being sunny or it's, if it rains, it can affect the pedestrian traffic. We know these things. So how about we have something different, a hierarchical reality? How about we have accident game affecting traffic, sunny and rain conditions affecting pedestrians, and a new dish that directly affects their bookings. And all of this leads to how busy my restaurant is going to be. So this leads to some other mathematical questions that we're going to look at. Suppose you toss a coin and you see heads. What would be your idea of uh, coming up with a prediction for the next coin toss? Any answers, guesses? No, it's not 50%. You don't know if it's biased or unbiased. You've only seen a single toss, and all you see is heads. What would be your next prediction? You, you have nothing, just one information, single sample. It would be heads again, because you have single sample and you see heads, it's 100%, right? Unless you don't know what if tails is on the other side. Suppose you toss again and you still see heads. So you, you would say that this coin is biased. But is it actually biased? It is not because you don't have enough samples. So your model should account for uncertainty in the number of samples that you've seen. And the answer to that is Bayesian modeling. Bayesian modeling can account for not just the, uh, the prediction, but also can give you an estimate of the variance 
as to how unlikely or un how uncertain your prediction is on the coin toss. And suppose I toss the coin five times and I would probably see three out of five uh, heads, then I would still say it's biased or it could be even two out of five. But my uncertainty should reduce as I increase the number of coin tosses. And that's where Bayesian modeling is extremely useful, uh, where you can have a paradigm that can depend on the number of samples and your uncertainty gets lesser and lesser or your variance can be modeled. And what if a sample is missing? Can you account for, for, for that? Can, you, can your machine learning model conventional supervised learning run, learn uh, in, in terms of a neural net or a deep learning? So it, these are cases, these are questions that can be answered with uh, probabilistic graphical models. And can it explain causality? What is causality? Causality is A affecting B, B affecting C and C affecting the result. That is called causality. That is something that is a tough problem and it is useful to know that. You'll see more when we give uh, hands-on examples when Ria talks about it. So the task was to predict busyness and given uh, the restaurant is busy, can you tell if the road to the restaurant had no traffic jams? Can, can you go the other way around? I know my restaurant is very busy today. Could you tell if the pedestrian traffic, what, how likely it's going to be busy or not? These are questions we need to answer. We need to go inside every single causal model we should be able to get inferences on what is happening that is actually leading to the result that we are seeing today, right? The explanations with quantified results, not, not qualitative results, but quantitative results on how much and why, so that I can hike my pay of the chef in this amount that I think the person is deserving. And what about dependencies in your explanatory variables? Okay, A affecting B and C is fine, but what about A, B, C and D affecting each other? Correlations have been done, but has causality been done with conventional methods? So these are questions that we try to answer today. And uh, we'll talk about explainable AI. And then, but before I get there, what I'll do is I'll let Ria take over. And this is a short background I've given you. So we are going to go through some examples and learn about how, what these things are. Uh, and then you can do some exercises on these notebooks. Download them using your, uh, your uh, geo or the any of the networks uh, from GitHub. And, uh, and then she'll go through the examples from the notebook that's out there, it's available for you. And you'll understand as to uh, how to uh, analyze, infer from a sample network. And after that, what we'll do is, we'll summarize the whole uh, lecture or talk, and, uh, and then we'll close uh, the session. Does that sound good to everyone? Any questions, we are available here, the team is here, who've, uh, added uh, the content. And so if you have any questions, we are around here to fix it. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So let me start by introducing myself. I'm Ria Agarwal, and currently I'm working in a AI-based research startup, Mysuru Consulting Group. And we will be talking about probabilistic graphical models. And what I'm going to talk about is the basic building blocks so that you can create your own Bayesian models and you can infer, ask questions from it. So uh, let's start by defining what are these models? What exactly is a probabilistic graphical model? So it's just giving a mathematical framework to a already existing graph theory and the probability theory so that we can take into account some complex interactions which are happening between various random variables. So I would like to tell you the prerequisites which are there 
you need to know a basic probability theory and some statistics and yeah machine learning is essential so let me reiterate some very basic concepts so that we are on the same page everyone um, what is probability the number of favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes so if you roll a dice and i'm telling you it's an unbiased one so what is the probability of you getting one is 1 by 6 and then what are random variables random variable is a value which is a numerical outcome of a random phenomena so the phenomena which leads to it is completely random and a random variable can either be discrete or it can be a continuous one and for a discrete random variable we actually uh, define the probability function as a probability mass function so it will be in the form of a bar chart but for a continuous one it will be a continuous curve and in order to calculate the probability we have to take into account the area which is under the graph so that's the difference between a discrete and a continuous random variable and then comes the bayesian methods or the conditional probability what is the conditional probability is if you are given some evidence about a certain event happened what is the probability of another event happening so if you are given like oh okay event y happened what is the probability of now x happening so it is given by this equation which is a joint probability of both the events happening at the same time which is x and y both the events and which is divided by the marginal or the probability of only the event y happening and then there is also the chain rule for bayesian models and if you have a probability distribution over a lot of random variables how can you break it into conditional probabilities so uh, these are very important equations which i think you already know just reiterating them then comes a very important concept which is marginalization so marginalization is suppose you have a probability distribution over two variables and you want to reduce it it to a single variable so what you will do is you will sum over the variable which you want to eliminate all the values of the variable taken into account and summing over it now there are basically two types of graphical models one is the bayesian model and the other is the markov model the bayesian model is a directed acyclic graph there are no cycles in a bayesian model it's not there and the nodes represent the random variables of a event which is happening and the edges represent causality for example the weather outlook will actually affect whether you are going to play cricket it's not the other way around so there is a direction there is a causality but in case of markov networks you don't have any causality you have only correlation there is no causality in the picture and again the nodes even in a markov network they represent random variables and it's a undirected graph but it can have cycles in it so we can actually estimate those models in which we have cycle which a bayesian network cannot so next comes these are the two examples which we will be dealing with very toy examples in today's workshop and so there are there is a bayesian network in which what is happening is you have two random variables which is humidity and wind and this is going to affect what the weather is going to be like on that particular day which in turn will affect whether you can go out and play that day or not so this is a very toy example and then there is a markov network in which we have four debaters they are debating with each other but they have some correlation with each other at the same time they tend to agree with someone more they tend to disagree with someone more so we will take into account these two uh, examples today in today's workshop so first yeah so if we talk about like markov chains so that yeah. also tells us like <coughs> what will be the next thing after certain things so if i talk about markov chain okay so let's say a b c d we also try yeah. to predict the order okay i think uh, i will cover that in the later slide I am just going to talk about yes, there is a flow of influence. You know, yeah. Yeah, A can affect B. 
that's there. But that so is. Go from node A to node B. Yeah. yeah. So, so there is, they are directed. No, uh, they are not directed. They are not directed. There is no causality. I mean, they are related to each other. They affect each other. Definitely, they affect each other. That's the only differentiation. Yeah. There's. Th That is, the, that is, uh, you know, you are talking about the hidden Markov models. I'm going to cover it. That comes under the Bayesian models. So, so the transition is there, but it's not seen as direction. So the transition probability. Yeah, we will talk about transition from one state to the other. That is the hidden Markov model, which and comes under the Bayesian. The yes, yes, yes. Uh, these are Markov networks. I know it's a bit confusing, the names, but yeah, that comes under the Bayesian because one state affects the other state. It's a direct causality. They I will come to sense. it. They yeah, yeah. Sense, yeah, 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 yeah. It's there. It's there. So Bayesian networks. Um, as we know, each node represent a random variable, and each node has a CPD, which is a conditional probability distribution. And in order to calculate the joint distribution, we will just take into account the products over all the CPDs that there are in the network. So as we already discussed this example, now we will see <coughs> the maths, how to calculate various conditional probabilities, how to go about exploring this model more and more. So this, these are the conditional probability distributions which are related to each and every node. And as you see, humidity and wind, because they don't have any parents, so these probabilities are direct found out from the data itself. There is uh, nothing is affecting them. These are completely random. There is no causality. But the weather outlook, it has a causality and it depends on the humidity that day and the wind that day. So the weather outlook will be given, the probability of a weather outlook will be given by how was the humidity that day and how was the wind. So there is a condition. Given the humidity and wind, what was the probability of it being a sunny day, it being a cloudy day, or it raining that day. And then again, the weather outlook will actually affect whether are you going to play or not play that day. So in order to calculate the joint distribution over the three variables, which are humidity, wind, and the weather outlook, we have three CPDs. We will take the product of the three CPDs. and it will give us a joint distribution. So the joint distribution will sum up to 1, and we can get some useful insights into it. Again, when I talked about the marginalization, if we want to remove the weather outlook, how can I remove the weather outlook from the joint distribution? I know there can be three types of weather outlooks. I will sum over the probabilities of all the three of them. And I will calculate the probability distribution <coughs> over humidity and wind. So now, uh, no, it's not. So next comes the causal reasoning. So how does knowing one variable affect the other one? So suppose that we know that the probability of you playing cricket on a certain day is 0.5. There's a 50-50% chance that you will play cricket that day or not. Now, you get a new evidence. Okay, the winds are extremely strong that day. Will it affect your probability of playing cricket? Yeah. So, how, how to give it a certain structure? So, what will happen is wind will affect the weather outlook. There is a flow of influence from wind to weather outlook to playing cricket. And because of that, the probability of playing cricket given the winds is actually less than the probability of playing cricket given no evidence at all. So this is what is called the causal reasoning. Next comes the evidential reasoning. So suppose we know that the probability of humidity being high is 0.25. And then we make an observation. OK, it is raining today. So will this affect the probability of humidity being high that day, given the evidence? You, you know it's raining. So you know the humidity is high, intuitively. But how do you get to that inference by looking at the model? Because humidity and weather, they are directly uh, 
connect it to each other. So weather outlook can actually directly influence the humidity. So let's come to the interesting example where we know that it is raining and we also know that the humidity is high. So will it affect the probability of wind being strong? It should, right? So there is a flow of influence from humidity, weather outlook and wind. Suppose you know that humidity is high and you don't know the weather that day. Will it affect the probability of winds being strong? No, it will not. Because the flow of influence will be obstructed because you have not observed the weather outlook. So, this is one major difference. When you see the structures, you get to know which variable will affect which variable, whether they will affect or whether they will not affect. So, these are all the six basic kinds of graphs which can exist. There is no other kind of relation which can exist in a Bayesian network. So we know in which cases can the influence flow from A to B. So if they are directly connected, it will flow, which is the first two cases. If they are connected through another random variable, the influence will flow. And if they are connected in a V structure, it, the influence will not flow. For the influence to flow, you need to observe the C variable in the V structure. So this explains that if the C variable is given, then yes, yes, in the first two cases, yes, there is a direct correlation, it will affect. But if C is observed in the, in the uh, bottom two cases, so there will be obstruction in the flow of influence. Now A cannot affect B. So you have blocked the trail. But if you have observed C, in the V structure, you have actually activated the trail. So in that case, A can actually affect B. So what are active trails? Active trails are the trails where the influence can flow. So if we have an active trail from A to B, we know that the influence can flow from A to B. For that to happen, we need to activate all the V structures and no other node should be observed in the active trail because observing a node will actually obstruct the flow of influence. And active trails actually give rise to a very important phenomena which is independence. If two random variables are independent, then the probability of a joint distribution over A and B would be just the product of the two <coughs> probabilities. And if A is independent of B, then probability of A happening given B will just be the probability of A. And by the chain rule, we can even tell what will the probabil probability of A and B given C if A and B are independent. So independence, like I said in the Bayesian structure, if you are activating a trail, then there is no independence. But if the trail is not activated, there is independence. So if you have observed <coughs> the parents of a given node, then the node is independent from all its non-descendants because now it cannot affect any other random variable. So naive Bayes is the most commonly used Marco, uh, sorry, Bayesian network that is there. And we make a very strong independent independence assumption in a naive Bayes model that is all the random variables are independent of each other. So this <coughs> by using this very strong assumption, we come to the conclusion that the joint probability will actually be given by this equation where no random variable or features have any kind of influence over the other one. And then comes the Markov assumption that the future is independent of the past if you know the present. And to give it a graphical structure, it will be a straight line where all the random variables are connected to each other. So for example, if you know x2, then uh, will 
x 3 be affected by x 0 and x 1? No, right, because you have <coughs> obstructed the trail. So, this is the independence assumption that we are making and we are giving it a graphical form. And hence, the probability distribution would be given by the following equation, keeping into mind the independence and keeping into mind the chain rule, which happens. Now, these are the dynamic Bayesian networks. So, in dynamic Bayesian networks, we can actually define a network over a large period of time, just taking into account just two slices of time, which is a time slice t and a time slice t plus 1. And it behaves almost exactly like Bayesian networks. It's only that you unroll it and you define it in only two slices of time. And you infer things from it. And most of the time, it <coughs> follows the Markov assumption that given the present state, the past state cannot affect the future. And here's the hidden Markov model, which comes under the Bayesian. So given state 0, the CPD is different for a hidden Markov model. So we have a finite state automata. So we know if you know your present state, it doesn't matter what your previous states were. It will only and only depend on your present state, the future state that is going to happen. <coughs> so if, suppose, S0 is state A, then what will be the state in S1 will only and only depend on SA. Because this is the CPD which will affect it, which will affect the transition. And then comes the plate model, which helps in the reuse of the structure of a Bayesian networks and the various parameters. For example, we are rolling a dice n number of times. So we don't want to write n random variables. We will just create a plate around that and we will say all of them are actually affected by one parameter. It helps in reuse of the structure and the parameters. And the plate models can be of two types which are overlapping plates and the nested plates. So overlapping plates, so the location in this overlapping plates example is, look, uh, is repeated m times and quality is repeated p times. So the by is repeated m into p times. Again, for nested one, the only difference is the quality in the nested plates is actually repeated m into p times. So plates actually helps you to reuse a lot of structure and understanding it better. Now we will jump on to the Markov networks, which are undirected graphs. And the nodes of a Markov network, they represent random variables. And as we know, So that is actually structure learning that falls under structure learning. So one of the major advantages of Bayesian networks is it will help you to use your prior knowledge. So if you have a lot of prior knowledge about a particular task and if you want to deploy it, you can use Bayesian networks very, very efficiently. But so if Uh, so, there are two different uh, methods uh, that falls under 
but then the proximity instruments are different. Where you can learn the structure and tell you that uh, these could be effectively a better language. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Markov network, it can be cyclic in nature, so it can represent certain dependencies which a Bayesian network cannot. <coughs> And instead of CPDs, now in a Markov network, we have something like factors. So factors can be viewed as potentials. <coughs> These are not probability distribution values. So in this particular case, suppose Amy and Bob are, deba are debating with each other. The probability that they are for the topic, which is A0 and B0, is mostly true because it has 0 0.8 potential value. But they disagreeing with each other is very less. So they are mostly on the same side whenever they are debating. And same goes for Sam and Bob. They very much like to agree with each other all the time because even if they are for the topic, even if they are against the topic, uh, sorry, for Sam and Bob, they are mostly not in agreement with each other. Yeah, sorry. So they want to fight with each other a lot. And so the potential values, they can take any value from the range minus infinity to plus infinity and they have their own scopes. And in order to get a potential distribution over, you know, a larger set of <coughs> random variables, we multiply the factors together. And suppose now we are taking into account four people. Now, Amy and Bob, they love to agree with each other. Bob and Sam, they love, they also love to agree with each other. And Sam and Tom, they love to fight with each other. And again, Tom and Amy, they love to again agree with each other. So somewhere, you know, the cycle is breaking because they are not agreeing with each other all the time. So how do you calculate the probabilities of Amy and Bob agreeing with each other and fighting for the topic or against the topic because somewhere the cycle is breaking because two people are always in disagreement. All of them cannot agree with each other all the time. So what happens is to calculate the unnormalized probability, we take the product of all the four factors and because it's unnormalized, we need to calculate the normalizing factor. In order to calculate the normalizing factor, we sum over a set of combinations of all the values that these random variables can take. We will see that with help of an example. So, in this case, term um, I didn't so get your question. Uh, and then there are certain connections which don't exist, right? So, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tom so and Bob, Bob are not. not yes. So, uh, is transitivity as usual? But <laughs> if you can see, Tom and Bob are connected through Amy. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they are related because they are connected through Amy and we have a flow of influence through Amy. So, it need not always be the case that, uh, you know, if you actually have a chance to connect Bob and uh, Tom, uh, whatever you infer basis, this connection through Amy may not happen. It could be an exact opposite. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So yes. Yes. So uh, now these unnormalized values are calculated by taking the product over all the factors and we sum over all of them to calculate the normalizing value and then we divide to calculate the normalized probability values. Now as you can see, now we tend to marginalize Sam and Tom from the picture. Now what is happening is you can see the difference between the potentials, what potentials tend to tell you and what the probability values tend to tell you. So the potential, they told you that, okay, uh, Amy and Bob, they always love to be in agreement. But when you got the probability values, you can see that's not the case. It's only true for half the time. Half the time they are in disagreement because we have two other people in picture. And if you put them in the same room, it will not happen that Amy and Bob will always be in agreement with each other. So this is just giving it a mathematical framework. 
and then comes the Gibbs distribution. Um, the only difference is that in a Gibbs distribution, your factors, they can have more than two random variables, unlike pairwise Markov networks, where your fact, uh, your, the scope of your variables was only two random variables. Here you can have three or four or as much as you like, depending on the application that you have in hand. And again, the unnormalized probability is calculated by taking a product. Again, you can calculating, uh, you can calculate the normalizing constant by summing over the set of all combinations of your random variables and then dividing both. So now when you have a graph, you can actually have different sort of factors. For example, if you're going for a Gibbs distribution, you can say, okay, this graph factorizes into, we can take groups of three. Or you can say, okay, no, I want to go for a pairwise Markov network. You can take groups of two. So which one is correct and which one is wrong? Actually, both of them are correct. So by looking at the graph, you cannot calculate or you cannot assume a factorization yourself. A graph can only tell you, okay, there is a flow of influence between these random variables. And if you observe a node, that flow is obstructed. So if you observe x2 in this case, then x1 can no longer affect x3 and x5. That is uh, the information that this graph tells you and nothing else. Now comes the interesting part, which is the conditional random fields. So mostly it's a sort of a Markov network and it is used when you have a large number of correlated features. There's a very high correlation between them. So taking into account all those correlations will be very difficult in a graph. So how do you predict? How do you use that information to actually predict something? So <coughs> here what we have is we calculate the unnormalized probability in the same way. We take into account the product over all the factors. But the only difference is to calculate the normalizing constant, we don't sum over all the random variables. We only and only sum over the target variable. So the distribution that there is over you know, the input or the correlated features doesn't matter to us. That is taken care of by itself. We don't care about because we already have that information. We don't want to calculate the distribution over the correlated features. That is not what we are calculating. We are only calculating the distribution over the target variable. How given these variables, it is affecting the target variables. We only are interested in that distribution. So we'll see that with the help of example. Um, this is a very basic example. Suppose you have just one feature, which, is, which can take a binary value, x0 or x1, and you're trying to predict a target variable, which can be y0 and y1. And you calculated the unnormalized probabilities, which I have taken as A, B, C, D. And we want to calculate the uh, conditional probability distribution. Like, what is the probability of Y happening given X is something? Then, if it was Gibbs distribution, the unnormalizing factor for us would be A plus B plus C plus D. But because this is a conditional random field, what we do is we take only and only we sum over y0 and y1, which is our target variable. So we divided by a plus b in the first two cases, and we divided by c plus d in the next two cases. Now what we have done is the correlation which was there, the distribution which was over the random variables, we have not taken that into account. We have assumed, we, ha we are given evidence, we have taken that, and we are not really concerned about you know, what is the kind of probability distribution that is there, that exists in the random variables. Um, log linear models. Yeah. Yeah, that is just for explaining things. Yeah, you are right, you are right. 
that I have done just to explain you what is the difference. Yeah, we should have at least two features if you are taking into account correlation. But this example is not wrong because we are calculating a conditional probability. We are calculating probability of <coughs> y given x. We are not calculating. Yeah, exactly. See, this is just to explain it to you. This is not a real life so example. Yeah. Uh, why would you even want to take features which are correlated in your prediction? Because those will explain the same variance in your y variance. Yes, exactly. So, uh, the example for it would be, for example, you are doing image segmentation. You have an image and you want to segment it into super pixels and it's widely used in that case. So, you have a cow and there is something in the background. You want to calculate, you want to know what is the feature of the cow. You want to take one super pixel and you want to name it a cow. Now what will happen is all the pixels which are inside the cow are highly correlated in terms of texture, color, everything. So if you use a simple Markov uh, model, then that correlation will give you a very biased probability value because you are taking into account the same texture, the same feature a lot many times, maybe five times or ten times. So what we do is we already know the texture is like this, we already know the colors are like this. Now how do you know whether it is a cow or not? Or how do you know whether this super pixel belongs to a car? Because yes. now Yes. No, that is the logistic regression example. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you I mean, you. Variables, yes. Yes. Actually, you use the yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is for a use case, actually, which uh, she's saying. So, what you are talking about, as she said, is uh, in the case of a logistic regression or a post price modeling, where you can go with an elimination, right? Here you can't el eliminate a pixel. You need to come up with a value that is reflective of all of the pixels around it depends on what use case you're looking at. Okay, uh, the log linear models. So, uh, in the log linear models, we define the factors differently. We take a exponential function, um, which, which is actually a multiplication of all the weights or coefficients and the features. So, the log linear models are highly employed in the field of NLP and some of state of the art algorithms are actually based out of this because you can define the features in so many ways and it will give you so many complex interactions and you can use it in any number of possible combinations. So, this helps and uh, the log linear models I would like to tell you is inspired from the Ising model in physics which is used for, you know, detection of ferromagnetism and uh, where you have, uh, you know, uh, dipole moments of atom atoms. So, um, in the log linear models, the energy function, oh yeah. So, in the log linear models, the energy function is used instead of the unnormalized probability distribution. So, you kind of take negative log of the unnormalized probability and it gives rise to a linear function because you are taking a negative log of an exponential function. So that is why the name log linear models. Now after you have your Bayesian network in place, you want to make decisions based on that. So how do you make decisions on the basis of a Bayesian network? So there is something called the utility functions which are used and highly deployed in making decisions. So you can define your own utility functions. Here I am taking an example that a student wants to get a job offer and a manager wants to know whether should I extend that job offer to that student or not. So what is happening? The utility function says that if the student is a poor performer and you don't give him a job, then your utility function is zero. And in the same case, if it's he is a poor performer and you give him a job, then your utility function is negative. And he's a great performer and you give him a job, your utility function has a very high value. So this can actually help you in determining, okay, which action should I follow? 
I think we'll now uh, get to the exercises. So we want you to do some hands-on. Yeah. So th the idea of presenting some of these uh, which are advanced, uh, even if you don't get it, well, the idea is to give you a breadth of what exists out there. But I think we should now get on to the problem-solving yeah. part. So go ahead and download these notebooks from GitHub. And uh, you can start experimenting with it. And uh, we'll go through these examples and show you how uh, these would work in reality. Uh, so go to GitHub. Uh, it's on it's on the notebooks uh, section. Yeah. MCG. Yeah. So the uh, so if you go to MCG hyphen AI slash notebooks on GitHub, you should be able to download these. We can help you with that. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, give it, give the link actually. The link is in the other presentation. Oh, okay. So here it is. So github.com. Uh, so it is uh, on github.com slash mcg hyphen ai slash notebooks. Yeah, or you can, uh, even you know, if you don't have a laptop, that's fine. We'll run through it, and you can see how it works. That's fine as well. You don't technically have to have the download. Is this visible to everyone, or should I increase the font, perhaps? Is this better? Okay. So PGM Pi is, uh, so you don't have to t technically run this, right? These notebooks are available for you. You can watch uh, while we run through these examples. You'll get an idea of how you can work with the Bayesian network. And we have a team, if you face problems, you know, can, uh, they'll come and uh, fix it for you. So PGM Pi is an open source library, and uh, what it does is uh, uh, it is able you're able to enter conditional probability distributions into it, and then get inferences from it. So what we are going to do is we're going to import a Bayesian model. So one of the things that you have to do is uh, specify. Uh, the nodes or random variables in the order of influences. Say, for example, uh, weather outlook is a child node uh, for uh, humidity and wind, and so also is playing cricket, right? So how do we build this model? We saw an example. Let's see how to build it. So the idea here is you're going to define a Bayesian model and instantiate that by providing your parent nodes with H, uh, weather outlook as WO, where you have uh, H affects WO in that order, and W also affects weather uh, outlook. And W, or the weather outlook, affects uh, playing cricket. So is this clear to everyone? So we're instantiating a model. And then what we do is we import the tabular uh, CPDs. So from pgmpy.factors.discrete, uh, we're going to imp import a tabular CPD. And we're going to create a humidity conditional probability distribution where we are going to uh, call the variable as H. And the variable card is going to have two, which means that there are two different possibilities of humidity. Right? It could be at a 75% or 25%. And they should add to one. So that's the idea. And similarly, let's create a wind uh, CPD, which means that it can have a value of 0.4 or 0.6. You could actually define wind as 0.4 as being the chance that it is going to be breezy and 60% chance that it's not going to be breezy. So that's the idea of. Uh, of looking at a conditional probability distribution. So also with humidity. Humidity, you could think of it as less humid and more humid. Right? Less humid is going to be 75%. 25% of the time, it's going to be more humid. So that's the idea of defining probabilities. And they sum up to 1. And let's uh, look at the evidence. What's an evidence, actually? So the evidence is essentially what we are doing here is we are saying that the weather outlook is dependent on the evidence of humidity and wind. And so you're going to define a WO variable or the conditional probability distribution, which is going to be dependent on these two. 
which means you're looking at a matrix here, all different possibilities, right? What happens if the weather outlook, if the weather is less breezy and if the humidity is high? So we need a table. We need this table to map and find out all different possibilities in the matrix. So that is what you're seeing here. 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, which basically is telling you that there are three different uh, possibilities or two different possibilities of humidity and then various possibilities of weather outlook. And let's look at the map of what to pick in a different scenario. So that's why it's called a conditional probability distribution because it is conditioned on the previous states. And now uh, we, are, we have to define another CPD for playing cricket, which is different values. What happens if we pick one of the values here in weather outlook, what would happen to the conditional probability distribution of playing cricket? So then what we do is uh, we add up these CPDs. We, uh, we basically add these CPDs and the, these need not necessarily be in order. You're basically, if you have entered all your condition probability distributions in the right order with evidences, then you should be able to uh, get uh, all the CPDs back and then also validate the model. You can validate the model and make sure that it is correct. And so in short, we are looking at, uh, let's print out the CPDs uh, using the get CPDs, which gives you uh, in an iterative manner. And so you're looking at your entire set of CPDs that you've entered. So as you can see here, a humidity a low and a humidity high, and a weather having different states will map up to your conditional probability distribution of a weather outlook. Is this clear to everyone in this example? Okay. And so also is uh, the playing cricket. So what happens, it doesn't mean that you will go and play cricket, right? There are dependencies. There could be possibilities for whatever reason that you choose not to. And so which makes it a probabilistic uh, uh, method or a sequence. So now you're looking at different states of weather outlook. And then uh, whether you're going to play cricket or not is going to depend on your weather outlook. So that's the idea. And then you can compute the probabilities using evidence. So variable elimination is an algorithm, essentially, to find out uh, if uh, well, the idea is that you want to compute the probabilities and CPDs within the nodes by specifying evidence. So th this is another way where you can actually run queries. So you can query the variable. Uh, piece or uh, the playing cricket given that the evidence of humidity being low so you don't so the, the good thing here is this right if you look at the map you don't always have to have uh, every single distribution or data that's available for you to actually query your model this is now we've now we've built the model we have a model with the conditional probability distributions we need to get inferences from it we need to harness it and the way to do that is, let's say we only have evidence that the humidity is low. With, so we're going to assign a state to it, which is zero. And then we're going to find out what different possibilities of playing cricket is going to be. And you can see that with no other evidence or uh, available evidence that we have uh, about uh, the wind or uh, any, any other value, all we are saying here is that given the humidity, you can tell uh, that the probability of playing cr uh, cricket is going to change from 0.36 and 0.63 is going to be the chance that you would play. So these are in, these are examples of uh, of having or gathering informa information from uh, your model. What happens if there's no evidence? Suppose there's zero evidence. Then what would be in a normal state with having no additional information, what is the probability of playing cricket? So you don't have to specify the evidence. And then what it would do is using chain rule, you can actually compute these probabilities. And they change naturally because there is a flow of influence. right? Because there is a flow of influence, having or specifying or not specifying a value will change your probability. So you can also do something called evidential reasoning, which is, uh, which is basically a bottom-up. So bottom-up, what that means is, what is the probability of day being windy given that we played cricket? So th this is where you actually harness. So think of this, how powerful this can be. Suppose you have a large model and you want to find out that, I know what the end result is, but I want to find out what what would it affect or what affected it? So you're going to do something uh, backwards from your Bayesian model, which is you know that uh, that you actually played cricket, and but you want to find out what is the probability of the day being windy that day. And you can actually query your model and using Bayesian, these are all basically based on very simple Bayesian principles and chain rule, that these are co computations happen, but they're very powerful. So you can find out that you can say that, yes, it was less breezy, we know, uh, the probability is less breezy because we did actually play cricket. And what is the probability of less humidity given that it was a sunny day? So another form of uh, getting inference. 
So you can see that you can be all different possibilities are possible here. And these questions, what does it bring us up to? These questions essentially are the questions that you would have when you run your model, but you were afraid to ask, right? So that, that's, that's the uh, power of Bayesian networks. And conditional independence, as we talked about it. So conditional independence is a nice uh, criterion. The idea here is if I tell you or give you an additional data set, then the two values become independent. We are, we are already working with graphical models. A lot of you who've used Naive Bayes, as Ria was saying, is a graphical model. It is a conditional independence because once you know the class, your data samples are independent of each other. If you don't know the class, they are dependent. So in a Bayesian structure, let's say we have three random variables. And so the, the, uh, the idea here is that your humidity and your uh, playing cricket is going to be independent if the weather outlook is given. So you can actually look at uh, the Markovian chain, as someone was asking questions on, also falls into the same paradigm. And these are what uh, PGMPy uh, gives you. It's, an o it's the only open source library that we know is very powerful amongst the other ones. And we are contributing to that ourselves, and we invite everyone else to also contribute to it. So one of the things that we would like all of you to do using this is that the most important thing here is what we want you to do is to find out and then run different possibilities and find out what happens to your probability. How does it change if you change your inputs? Or if you change your output result, what happens to your inputs? So these are different questions that you can ask and query your network. And what about all independencies in the model? There, there are many more independencies that we know if we have additional data. So to, to make it clear what conditional independence is, to give you an idea about it is, if you have uh, sufficient information, that information alone is enough to give you uh, any other idea about the conditional variables that are independent of each other. If, if, that, if that information is missing, then there is a flow of influence that happens. And active trail falls into it again. So you can find out if the model has an active trail between any node to any node. Those are different features of this. This is an open source library, by the way, just to give you an idea. It's not proprietary, it's out there, and, uh, and people are, and we have researchers contributing to it. So you can also find out V structures. Like uh, as Ria was explaining, there are V structures are where uh, if you have, a, if you observe the value, you then it activates the trail. What does that mean actually? What that this is a little bit confusing compared to all other uh, structures. V structure is what what you're actually saying is you're reducing the sample space or possibilities. If you know that, for example, you, let's observe if wind influences humidity. Right? Those are independent of each other. We know, wind and humidity are not related to each other. However, if I know my weather outlook is actually bad or good, then I know for sure that, and if I also have additional ev evidence about wind, I know my humidity cannot be low. So that is the idea of V-structure. Given additional information, your probability will only pick certain samples from the sample space, and so it reduces the probability or increases the chance of it falling into one or the other bucket. So uh, how much time do we have till? 15 minutes, okay. So, perfect, okay. So what I'll do now is, I'm not gonna talk more about this because the idea here was to give you a fair sense of the power of the network that you can, with, a, with an example. Now let's get back to the slides to cover, uh, to summarize everything that we've seen so far. And uh, let's see what, what things can be, what uh, can be done with the Bayesian network as well as, um, as well as the Markov uh, random fields and other more advanced areas. So this falls into something we think is explainable AI, right? And this is a standard. So explainable AI covers many, many areas. But when does your model actually become explainable? It becomes explainable when you can ask questions from it and you get answers from it. Quantitative answers that you can actually measure. So PGMs can visualize these structured models, and Marco networks can help build these association networks. You can identify anomalies with this. The anomaly in short is if your probability is low, it is an anomaly, or if it is very high, it is an anomaly, right? And you could model data, uh, models, you can build models out of sparse data sets. You can predict from a single sample. You can actually build models from few samples. 
very few samples. You don't have to have all the samples. The only the caveat here is your model is going to be uncertain to the extent that your data won't change. If your data changes over time, then your variance is going to change over time, which is expected. So the, the, uh, it allows you for you to build from sparse data, build models from sparse data. And the applications are huge. We'll talk about a few use cases ourselves. So let's see. So what we saw is we can learn how busy is a restaurant given the data. You can actually use the same model and build it out. You can build a Bayesian network with actual values. And what you can also do is you can feed in the values from real time data that you've collected in a supervised fashion and then fit the data to learn the conditional probability distributions. The question comes down to how do I learn these CPDs? What if you don't know, right? You can collect data and then learn these values. Oh. Okay. All right. So, uh, so you can learn the CPDs, and what? And someone asked a very interesting question. It is very interesting because it is a problem, which is structural learning. What if I don't know my structure? That is actually a good question. So it then falls down to n different possibilities. We can learn them, and that's where algorithms can be useful. You can come up with efficient algorithms because as your number of nodes increase, then it's you'll have to come up with methods that can quickly detect the structure. And there are algorithms for uh, structural learning. What what it falls into. So what we saw, we can also tell if a restaurant is busy that a game isn't going on or that the road is pretty clear. You can get evidence or you can tell how likely these, uh, while these events are going to be. So does the condition probability of the game change if we observe traffic and accident? So these are questions that we should, we should be asking and we can ask. And new data and new evidence. So suppose you have new data, right, or new evidence. Suppose there is another uh, a factor that affects your entire network. You can easily incorporate that. You can build on it. So finally, you can actually tell how likely is the introduction of a new dish is with the probability and the variance. So we saw what these CPDs are essentially. So you can come up with uh, the, you saw that the CPDs can be entered into different states. So as you see, sunny falls into two states and if you assume rain, rainy is going to fall into two states for simple reason that it's going to rain or not rain with the probability, then your table is going to tell you all different possibilities that you can pick of uh, if a pedestrian is going to be walking or not walking. And, uh, and then you can answer all complex questions with influence, flow of influences. You can detect flow of influences. This flow of influence is going to be very useful to you. The reason is given certain data sets in a large network, for example, you can tell what led to your result, final result. And so case studies, so fraud models, this is one of the uh, famous fraud models from, uh, uh, from one of the papers by David Heckerman and uh, it's a part of refactor.ai uh, who was our client essentially. So the idea here is you can say suppose a fraud occurs, what does a thief do? Perhaps kick on the car and then buy gas and flee away from the scene, buy a lot of jewelry perhaps, right. Um, and age and sex, let's say men and women are equally probable to be thieves, 0.5%, 50%. And let's say the age band is going to, it's possible that people from 30 to 50 are more likely to be thieves that we see from the data. This can be learned from the data. And so we have a CPD for probability of age, probability of uh, sex, and probability of committing fraud. And as you can see, the, the, uh, the relationship is different here. Committing a fraud leads to someone actually buying gas. So now saying if a fraud has occurred or not occurred will actually influence if a person actually bought gas or jewelry. And you can ask questions such as, given that we know the fraud has occurred, was it done by a male or a female? Who's likely to have done it? So this is going to be very useful for you to detect or do a backward analysis. And you can also have, if you have additional information about the age, then you can round off with a better probability score on who likely would have done it. And credit risk models, these models given payment history, outstanding loans, can you actually come up with uh, predictions of interest rates, probability of the interest rates, and causality as we talked about earlier. And most importantly, what uh, this is something that we are using as well and you can use as well, which is uh, record uh, linking various fuzzy uh, deduplication of records. This can be done using graphical models, Poisson gamma models, 
to figure out say the suppose there are two names that differ slightly and that rate is going to change over time you can uh, merge these records using graphical models and of course this is some one question that nobody asked but you might end up asking is what about continuous cases we've only seen discrete probability distributions what about continuous probability distributions right so these are called as linear gaussian models which is one type of there are more continuous models than these but linear gaussian models are uh, one uh, area of continuous models very crucial uh, they are also known as linear dynamical systems or Gaussian Bayesian networks. Uh, they are used for object tracking and even robotics. So this is in short covers pretty much everything that we had to uh, tell and uh, this is also motivated by one short learning paper by Brendan Lake. What, uh, what he claims is that if children can learn effortlessly why do we need a million samples to train. And uh, this paper is a, is a, a very renowned paper. And um, graphical models, hierarchical models are one ways to solve this problem. Any qu now, I'll, I will take questions now. So, in terms of, uh, if you look at the major advantage, you've got you need a lot of data for deep learning, and you need less data for this. So, do you have an idea of, or some experimental research in terms of how much data do you need to get to similar levels of accuracy? That's a good question. Uh, we've not done any research or experimental results ourselves. We have done some experiments on uh, coin tosses for illustration that you can look at. And uh, in, the, in the coin toss you can see how the variance actually reduces as your number of samples increases. But once you have the fair estimate adding any more samples will not help essentially because you are only learning you have already learnt what you need to learn. And with deep learning what helps there however is if there are additional variances that you, you, you can end up learning with additional neurons. But if it is not sufficiently going to change you might be happy with the result essentially what I am trying to say. So it depends on the use case and how your data changes. If, if you have a streaming data then it is a different question because if you have a streaming data this happens in linking various records together right. You might have a new data dump that you get and you need to link these records up. Then your rate of error could change which can basically change your model. Okay, so second related question. Suppose you look at natural language processing. Yeah. There are rules in place for grammar. Sure. So there is prior knowledge Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then you use probability. Yeah. Could you possibly get to a better yeah, already accuracy with lesser data than deep learning? Well, I would not compare deep learning with accuracies because I myself have not uh, applied both on a simple uh, example to claim anything. But one thing I can tell is graphical model is already used in LDA. If you have used topic mod done topic modeling and uh, used LDA, it is a graphical model and uh, gives you far more accurate results than traditional transfer frequency inverse document frequency that it does because it is just more honest with respect to the structure that you are drawing samples from. And most importantly something that I did not talk about is that this falls into an area called generative models which means if you have the model you can draw data from it. You can create uh, fake or it is not exactly fake but rather uh, you can create instances of fraud. If you have a fraud model you can draw samples and say this particular instance is a fraud something that might not have occurred earlier. So you can draw samples from your distribution. That's why it's called generative. Sure, yeah. So generative models. Let's say uh, you have a generative model of a fraud, right? Uh, detection. Then, if you want to uh, create some instances to showcase what kind of transactions in credit cards could be looked upon as fraud, you could generate those cases. You can randomly sample and generate these cases. So supervised, so th that again is a term. So super, this can fall into supervised too, right? This is semi-supervised, you can call it, because the CPDs can be learnt from data. So it is supervised, right? If you're comparing to neural networks, for example, then that's a black box and this is a white box. That's the major difference that you're looking at. Right. 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 And hence the prediction that you make is also a factor or a derivative of the bias that you see. Correct. How do you make sure that the prediction that you make are less dependent on the bias that you tested? 
So that is a very good question, it falls into two things, one is, is your data actually biased or have you collected less data which is, which happens to be biased, those are two questions that has, that is depend on, later one which you have collected less data and you have not collected all which is actually one biased, right, 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 so that is exactly where this is useful actually because when you have less data you can come up with a prediction with an uncertainty, so you will have a, you will have a biased prediction but you will have an uncertainty associated with it, as your new data comes along it becomes, it shifts to uh, the right value, in fact I can, I do not know if I can show you an experiment to that respect, I might have it here, uh, just to show you one of the, so refactored is uh, where you can actually, it is open and there are more examples uh, which is now also part of SUNY Buffalo, so uh, graduate school curriculum, so that is another area where, uh, that is another place where you could actually. So you can do it both ways, if you think your data is imbalanced, you can balance your data and train your model in the conventional fashion, but if you want, do not want to do that, you can feed your data as it is to reflect the bias in your prediction and then come up with a uncertainty score saying, hey look, I have a prediction but this is no, I am not very certain, as more data comes along, it is going to, the mean is going to shift to the right prediction value. Correct. Sure. You can have a 60 percent male and 40 percent female distribution, like a class in balance. Sure. Or 80 20. Sure. But in the male, you might have a higher early salary male. Sure. Sure. Now, this is not a class in balance, but a higher bias. In sure. The yeah. I think you want that, right? You want that bias. I don't think you want that. Because if you are saying that your data is biased with 60 percent and 40 percent, you want to keep that probability of being a male is going to be 60 percent. So if you randomly pick a sample, you are going to find more females than male, then you want to, you want that in your model. So why wouldn't you want that unless your data you collected is imbalanced. So that is why I was saying, if you want that bias where, where lot of the inputs are biased, right, you are going to, this will basically boil down to probability score. If 70 percent of my time I see uh, males in my result, I want to assign a probability of 0.7 to it. That, that is the way, that is the how, in fact, that is exactly what Bayesian networks depends on. So you want that. Suppose your data that you collected is wrong, that is a different issue. That you have to do what you would do in any other case. You use any kind of balance or under sampling, over sampling, you can do whatever, that, that is independent of your model. But if your model is going to account for bias, you need that bias. I do not know if that is clear. Correct. Correct. Yes. And what would a supervised model do in that case? So, uh, for example, you let us take the toin cause, coin toss example. And if, uh, for example, you are, you have taken 100 samples, but the person who is supervising, he never accounts for the tails so, some of the times. So, you can say that that is a bias that this person has, right? You are talking about something like this, right? So, for that bias, there is some thing called the prior in Bayesian networks. So you can take a prior and you can assign the prior such a value that it takes into account such a scenario that okay, the person who is supervising, he is a biased person. He will never account for the tails which happen so many times. So you will give more weightage to whenever a tail happens than to a head. So, so here is an example. It is a prior that you give before taking into account the probability values, you give a prior to it. <coughs> yeah, you can work with the weights, yes. So and those are called as conjugate priors uh, precisely and here is an example you can see that um, if with a single sample your uncertainty is a uniform distribution with a coin toss, right. Then what is happening as you collect more samples your prediction is biased here. If you see 4 heads out of 10 tosses you will end, uh, end up with 0.4 somewhere around that, but you have a high uncertainty around it. When you, as number of samples increases, you get an, for an unbiased coin, you would get 0.5 as your result, but with a less uncertainty. 
So this this is the uh, advantage uh, of Bayesian modeling, where you could uh, use all the previous samples, and then your prediction gets better and better, but your and your uncertainty reduces. So this is an example on coin toss. The Stanford has con uh, conducted some experiments on with just uh, coin toss data, and you can use it to uh, come up with Bayesian models. Absolutely, this falls into online learning. The online learning, one of the ways uh, of uh, best working with online learning, uh, what you are talking about is a graphical model. Where you, and the advantage here is you do not need to train on everything again. You can throw your previous samples away and only train on the new samples. Yes. Yeah. Actually, in our youth, you surely, guys, we have around five k features. Yes, yes. We can't directly say what they're yeah. dependent on. Yes, the yes, yes. So how do this work in that case? I think you are repeating the same question, which is structured learning. So when you don't have the entire structure, there are approximate inference and uh, 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 the structured learning algorithms to learn the dependency. So in uh, in short, to give you an idea, you try all the different combinations and fit CBDs. The one that fits best is what you pick. There are map algorithms and MLE methods. So structured learning usually is based on either maximum a priori algorithm, Bayesian method again, or a maximum likelihood estimation. I can send you papers on that. And uh, the current PGMPI already supports that. We have examples there as well. You can take a look at it. Uh, yes, the PGMPI does support a priori implementation. I do not know that. It depends on the use case, I would say. I do not have an answer, a general answer on that. I do not understand your question, A. B, we can talk about it later. I think it is more involved. Any? Uh, no, no, there is no. Uh, in fact, deep learning can be used in this paradigm too, right? If you have 5K features, you need to have GPUs to learn. So deep learning I was talking about with respect to deep neural nets, not necessarily deep learning as such. So deep neural nets, in fact, the one-shot learning I think uses deep nets. Right, right. So in this case, you do not have a prime. Yes, like, yes, yes. Correct, correct. So that is a good question. You, so this can turn into a hidden Markov model. What exists underneath is different from what you are observing, right? So there is a noise that you add to it. So it falls into the paradigm of uh, something that is related to a hidden Markov model. Thank you, everyone.